Have you ever wondered why airplanes don't fly over Antarctica? It's a question that has piqued the curiosity of many, especially those with a keen interest in aviation or geography. Our journey begins in the southernmost part of our planet, a place where the sun can shine for 24 hours a day during the summer and darkness can consume the landscape for an equally long stretch in winter. This is Antarctica, a frozen continent that is roughly one and a half times the size of the United States and is nestled at the bottom of the world isolated by the tempestuous Southern Ocean. Now, if you've ever glanced at a globe, you might think that flying over Antarctica could be a handy shortcut for certain long-haul flights. But if you've ever been on such a flight, you'll notice that the flight path conspicuously avoids this icy expanse. A common assumption many people make is that planes avoid Antarctica because of the extreme cold. And it's not entirely baseless. After all, Antarctica is the coldest place on Earth, with temperatures dropping as low as negative 89 degrees Celsius. That's cold enough to freeze fuel and create all sorts of problems for an aircraft. However, while the cold can indeed pose challenges, modern airplanes are designed to withstand extreme temperatures, both hot and cold. They routinely fly at altitudes where temperatures can drop to a brisk negative 56 degrees Celsius. So, if it's not just the cold, then what is it that makes the skies over Antarctica so mysterious and seemingly off-limits to commercial airlines? The truth is, the reasons why airplanes don't fly over Antarctica are much more complex, and they involve not just meteorological considerations, but also navigational and safety concerns, geopolitical agreements, and even economic factors. But the real reasons are much more complex than just the cold. Let's delve deeper. And as we do, we'll uncover the intriguing mix of factors that keep the skies above the world's coldest, driest, and windiest continent largely free of the contrails we're so used to seeing elsewhere. Firstly, there's something called the Antarctic Treaty. This international agreement signed in 1959 sets Antarctica as a scientific preserve, banning military activity on the continent. It's an agreement that has a profound effect on air travel. The Antarctic Treaty, composed of 54 parties, maintains Antarctica as a place of peace and science. It's an agreement that bans military activity, including military flights over the continent. This means that no country can claim sovereignty over any part of Antarctica, ensuring the land remains undisturbed for scientific research. This ban extends to the airspace over Antarctica, which is why you won't see military planes zipping across its icy landscape. But the impact of the Antarctic Treaty doesn't stop at military flights. It also has significant implications for commercial air travel. The treaty is designed to minimize human impact on the Antarctic environment. This means that flight paths that could potentially disturb the local wildlife or damage the delicate ecosystem are a no-go. Think about it. Every time a plane flies overhead, it leaves behind traces of pollution. Now imagine that happening over a pristine, untouched wilderness like Antarctica. The impact could be devastating. And so, in order to protect this unique and fragile environment, the Antarctic Treaty restricts commercial flights over the continent. However, it's not just about protecting the environment and maintaining peace. The Antarctic Treaty also ensures that Antarctica is available for scientific research. The absence of commercial flights ensures minimal disturbances, allowing scientists to conduct their research in peace. In essence, the Antarctic Treaty plays a significant role in keeping the skies above Antarctica clear of aircraft. It's a unique agreement that aims to preserve the environmental integrity of Antarctica while promoting peace and scientific research. But that's not all, there's more to the story. There are other factors involved in why planes don't fly over Antarctica, beyond the restrictions imposed by the Antarctic Treaty, so stay tuned as we delve deeper into this intriguing topic. Secondly, it's all about the Great Circle Route. If you're scratching your head and wondering, what's that? Well, don't worry, we're about to dive right into it. The Great Circle Route, in essence, is the shortest path between two points on a sphere. In our case, we're talking about our beautiful planet Earth. If you were to tie a string around a globe from one city to another, the string would outline the Great Circle Route. It's the reason why some flights may seem to take a curved path on a flat map they're following the Great Circle Route. Now you might be thinking, okay, but what does that have to do with Antarctica? Well, that's a great question. You see, the majority of intercontinental flights are between places in the Northern Hemisphere. That's where most of the world's population lives, and consequently, where most of the world's airports are. Imagine you're flying from Los Angeles to Tokyo. 
When you look at a flat map, it might seem logical to fly straight across the Pacific Ocean. But if you draw a line on a globe, you'll see that the shortest path actually takes you up near the Arctic Circle. That's the magic of the Great Circle Route. Now let's apply this concept to Antarctica. If you're flying from anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere to anywhere else in the Northern Hemisphere, the Great Circle Route doesn't take you anywhere near Antarctica. The continent is just too far south. Even for many flights within the Southern Hemisphere, Antarctica is often not on the shortest path. So, the location plays a significant role, but there's one more crucial factor. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, is the lack of emergency landing spots. Now, when we talk about air travel, safety is always paramount. One vital aspect of this safety net is the availability of emergency landing spots. These are carefully selected areas where an airplane can land in case of any unforeseen situation, be it technical malfunctions, sudden weather changes, or medical emergencies. Now imagine, you're cruising high above the clouds, miles away from civilization, and something goes wrong. Your first instinct is to find a safe place to land, right? Well, that's where things get tricky when flying over Antarctica. Why, you ask? Well, let's think about what makes a good emergency landing spot. It needs to be flat, clear of obstructions, and large enough for a plane to land safely. It also needs to have some form of infrastructure nearby to provide assistance if needed. In most parts of the world, you'll find airports, airfields, or even highways that can serve this purpose. But Antarctica is a different story. It's a vast, icy wilderness, mostly uninhabited and devoid of any significant infrastructure. It's like a giant white canvas, beautiful yet daunting. Its surface is covered with ice and snow, which makes it extremely challenging to land a plane safely. Even if a pilot could land, the lack of nearby infrastructure would make rescue and recovery efforts extremely difficult. Moreover, the extreme weather conditions in Antarctica are unpredictable and harsh, adding another layer of complexity to any potential emergency landing. Imagine trying to land a plane in a blizzard, with visibility near zero and gale force winds buffeting your aircraft. Not exactly an ideal situation, is it? So, while the idea of flying over the pristine landscapes of Antarctica may seem appealing, the practical realities are far less glamorous. The lack of suitable emergency landing spots presents a significant risk for air travel, and it's one that airlines and regulatory bodies are not willing to take. So it seems that safety is the real deal-breaker here. So let's piece it all together. We started our journey with the enigmatic skies of Antarctica, a place of majestic beauty and harsh conditions. Through our exploration, we've uncovered three main reasons why airplanes don't fly over this frosty continent. The Antarctic Treaty, the Great Circle Route, and the lack of emergency landing spots. Firstly, we dove into the Antarctic Treaty. This international agreement, signed by 54 nations, protects the pristine environment of Antarctica by limiting human activity, including air traffic. It's not merely a piece of legislation, it's a commitment to preserving one of the last untouched wildernesses on Earth. Next we navigated the Great Circle Route. This is the shortest path between two points on the globe, and it often dictates the flight paths of long-distance flights. However, for most routes, the Great Circle doesn't pass over Antarctica. The exceptions are flights between certain points in Australia or New Zealand and South America, but these are few and far between and there are other factors at play. Which brings us to our third point, the lack of emergency landing spots. Flying over Antarctica poses unique challenges. The extreme cold can affect aircraft performance and the vast, uninhabited terrain offers few places to land in an emergency. It's a risk that airlines are not willing to take. These factors intertwine like the threads of a complex tapestry. The Antarctic Treaty sets the legal framework, the Great Circle Route influences the geographical patterns of flight, and the lack of emergency landing spots adds a crucial safety dimension. Each factor on its own might not be enough to deter flights over Antarctica, but together, they form a compelling case. The avoidance of Antarctic airspace is a dance choreographed by law, geography, and safety. It's a testament to our respect for the environment our understanding of the Earth's geometry, and our commitment to the safety of air travel. So, it's not just about the cold, but a mix of legal, geographical, and safety reasons. Mystery solved, 